Welcome to the Walk Worthy Podcast, a podcast by Hesper Baptist Church located in Cambridge, Ontario. Our local church exists to make disciples who walk worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. We hope and pray this is encouragement to you and to anyone else you would share this with. Thank you, Julia, and everyone who have led us up front and behind the scenes to worship the Lord this morning. I have two questions to ask by way of sermon introduction this morning. The first is, how do you figure out what someone is really like? How do you do that? There's a whole string of phrases in the English language hinting at the solution to this challenge. We say things like, actions speak louder than words. The proof is in the pudding. No idea where that comes from. Put your money where your mouth is. I'll believe it when I see it. And there's probably some others that I'm just not even thinking about. When it comes to getting at the true essence of a person, the true nature of an individual, we do get the sense that more than mere words matter. And of course, these common phrases hint at or dance around what our Lord Jesus taught. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And Jesus expands on this in Mark chapter 7, 21 and 22. He says, for from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. For good or for ill, we know what a person is truly like on the inside by everything that comes out of them. And if we hang around someone long enough, then eventually we'll see the truth of what's really going on underneath. Underneath. Now, here's the second question. Have you ever thought about this when it comes to figuring out what God is really like? If one's words and actions reveal one's nature, one's character, one's essence, what do God's reveal about him? I believe God invites such a line of inquiry, that he invites such exploration. For example, Romans 1 19 and 20 indicates that what can be known about God is plain to humanity because God has shown it to us. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, can be seen, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So we're without excuse, and knowing God, we're justifiably judged for suppressing the truth about the existence and attributes of God that are on display all around us. We just have to look. But looking around at the created order will only take us so far in knowing God. Yet by God's grace, he has spoken and acted throughout history at various times and in various ways to further show us who he is. And this morning, we are going to have two events in view, separated by hundreds of years but inextricably linked. The first is the greatest act of salvation in the Old Testament, the exodus of Israel from Egypt, which is but a foretaste of the greater exodus that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can scarcely speak about the one without pivoting to the other, and as we do, when we look at what God says, and we look at what God has done, we will see that God is revealed to us in his redeeming. If we want to know what God is like, If we want to know his essence, his character, his nature, we will pay attention to what he shows us about himself in his saving acts in history. Simply put, God reveals himself to us in his redeeming. Now, if you're not a Christian listening to this, and you're inquiring about God, you're exploring Christianity, God's redeeming is the place to look to figure out what he's truly like. Now, if you're listening to this as someone who already is a Christian, in the course of this past week, I don't doubt for a second that you have experienced forms of spiritual amnesia. The 
press of the world is constantly trying to conform us to its mold. Indwelling sin is a beast we constantly battle. The fiery darts of the evil one slip past our defenses in moments of weakness and frailty. The futility of this groaning creation grates against us and it raises questions and raises doubts and raises fears that cause us to forget what God is like. Some of us came in here this morning confused about God's heart. Some of us came in here this morning angry with God. Some of us came in here cold, indifferent towards God. Some of us came in here worried that God probably has had quite enough of us because of the week that we just had. Some of us came here dry and weary. Some of us came in here this morning longing, God, I want to know you more. Well, let us then engage in this ordinary means of grace, the preaching of God's word, that we might either meet him for the first time or already knowing him, enjoy the blessing of spiritual deja vu, remembering what we had, we had forgotten, knowing him more as he reveals himself to us in his redeeming. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to read the whole chapter so that we don't spend 17 years in the book of Exodus. We're going to move at a good pace. It could be done, but I won't do it, so don't worry. Exodus chapter 3, it's pages 46 and 47 on the pew, in the Pew Bibles. If you need a copy of the scriptures, take that as your own. Use that. Base everything that you're about to hear me say against what you have in front of you. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, all the way down to the end of the chapter. Let's pray briefly before we hear God's word again. Father, help us to hear what the Spirit would say to us as a church as we read and as your living and active word is proclaimed, I pray that it would pierce and divide and afflict and comfort in all of the ways that each one of these individuals need and that we as a church need as a collective. And surely, Lord, this is not the work that any, a work that any man is equal to. And so may it be done, not by wisdom, not by might, but by your spirit, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 3, this is where we are in our series, verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take the, your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, 
What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go... You shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Exodus 3 follows a brief yet beautiful moment of God's perspective on all that's happened thus far to the people of Israel. From Exodus 1.1 to Exodus 2.23a, we see what's happening on the ground as the Israelites suffer at the hands of the seed of the serpent. And for two and a half verses at the end of chapter 2, we see what's happening in heaven. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. And then in Exodus 3.1, the narrative, the story, continues back down to earth, now Moses. But this time, heaven is going to show up in the ordinary circumstances of a guy putting in another day at work. God is going to come down to appear, to speak, to make good on his remembrance, which is his acting. God is going to redeem his people by an outstretched hand, his mighty arm. He's going to make them a kingdom of priests through covenant, and he's going to prepare them for his glorious presence, and at this all will know that Yahweh is God. And not only that he is God, but what kind of God he is. He reveals himself to us in his redeeming, and there are five aspects of his character, his nature, his essence that we're going to see as we work through these verses. First, and very clearly, God is holy. God reveals himself to us as holy in his redeeming of us. God is holy. Exodus 3, 1 marks an ordinary day in the 40-year exile of Moses in the wilderness, away from Egypt, away from the plight of Israel. And we've read what it says. He was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, who seems to have two names or a title and a name, Ruel and Jethro. He's a priest. Moses takes his flock to the west side of the wilderness where there's fresh pasture and he comes to the place that would come to be known as Horeb, the mountain of God. For the last four decades, Moses has been with the same company, which unbeknownst to him at the time is God's training program for his leadership in taking the Israelites out of Egypt. And today, Moses is about to find that out as verse 2 indicates. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. The reason this initially catches Moses' eye is because he looked, and just as it would be strange if one of these things was on fire and nothing was happening to it, that would be abnormal. The bush was burning, and behold, it was not consumed. Highly unusual. The fire keeps burning. The bush remains the same. And in one of those sort of internal conversations, as we try to pluck up the nerve to do something, Moses can assess to himself, okay, now please let's go and turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. I wonder how often Moses looked back on this moment, this defining moment. I wonder in his worst moments if he ever said to himself, I wish I had never gone to see 
for his life would never be the same. And three, four, when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Notice the equating of the angel of Yahweh appearing in the flame with God himself, as is true in other places in the Old Testament as well. This has led many to conclude that these appearances as, are that of the pre-incarnate Christ, of God the Son, who is one with God the Father, manifesting in human form before he added a human nature to his divine nature in the incarnation. However we may understand this, the angel of Yahweh speaks as God from the bush. In response to his name being called twice, Moses replies, as Abraham does before him and as Jacob did before him, here I am, or literally, behold me. In other words, I'm at your service. But as we'll see, as another puts it, Moses is the kind of guy who says yes first and asks questions later. And these next words that come from the mouth of Yahweh in verse 5 should stop us all in our tracks, as they would have Moses. First, reality that Yahweh wants Moses to know as he's called into his service. The first words after he hears his name, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. First time, this word appears in Scripture with respect to God, holy. So as God begins to reveal himself to Moses, which would extend to Israel and to Egypt and the nations around and the ends of the earth, the first lesson Moses receives in Yahweh's redeeming of his people is that God is holy. He is set apart. He is distinct from us. He is holy, holy, he's entirely holy, and he is holy other, he is entirely other. And this should cause us to tremble. And that it should is conveyed in three ways in Moses' encounter with Yahweh at the burning bush. The first is in those urgent command, those words, don't come near. If Moses were to get too close to the fire that doesn't consume the bush, he himself would be, for as he would later say, our God is a consuming fire. The purity of God's holiness would be the undoing of Moses, a sinful man, as would the purity of God's holiness undo every single one of us. Second, Moses is told in verse 5, take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. Now, Yahweh hasn't appeared here because this place is inherently holy. The place is holy because Yahweh has appeared there. And removing one's footwear in the ancient Near East would have been an expression of humility, of servanthood, of being in the presence of one who is greater and of displaying reverence towards that one who is greater. That's why God tells Moses to kick off his sandals. There is no company where this reverence should be shown more than in the presence of Yahweh, the Holy One. And third, as Moses is told who this is in verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Look at what Moses does. He hides his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Six times in verses 2 to 4, the same root word in Hebrew shows up. The angel of the Yahweh, uh, the angel of the Yahweh appeared. Moses looked. Let us turn and see the sight that Yahweh saw. And he turned to see a lot of looking going on, a lot of seeing going on. And then when Moses hears God's voice, what does he do? He hides his face, he covers his eyes, he's afraid. And such close encounters with the Holy One always elicit this response in sinful human beings. And even the angels, who since this service started have been crying out to one another before the presence of God, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. With one set of their wings, they are covering their faces. For it is a problem for all to come into the presence of this Holy One. And one day, like Moses, we shall. As Jesus used 3.6 to teach that God is the God of the living, not the dead, in Matthew 22, 
He is teaching that there is a resurrection. There is a life after this one. We will all come into the presence of God. And we will spend eternity in one of two places. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they have been in the presence of God in a delightful way since they died. Moses has been there since he died. But how is it? How could that be? How can sinners who should rightly be afraid to look at God ever fully enter into his presence? Let me illustrate this way. Earlier this year, I had a couple of almost terrifying experiences with my kids at the ocean. In Australia, where we were visiting my family at many different beaches along the coast, they build these tidal pools, swimming pools, into the ocean itself. And when the conditions are right, you can go to the end of the pool, the ocean's coming right up against it, you can go to the end of the pool, you can hold on to the bar or the chains as the waves come crashing over the wall. And we had a contest to see who could hold on the longest when the biggest walls of water would pound us, and sometimes you could hang on, and sometimes you could not, which was an absolute thrill. But as you were safely tucked behind the wall of the ocean pool, there was no danger of being swept out to sea. But if you went 12 inches forward on the other side, well, that would be a different story. That would be the end of you. So it would be the same for a sinner like Moses to draw too near, to look too closely on the glorious holiness of God. So it would be the same for us. Unless our unholiness be removed, unless a holiness be imparted to us that we could never attain, which no amount of religion could accomplish, we cannot come into the presence of this holy God. Yet hear this, not only is there grace in God's warning Moses to keep his distance so that he does not die, a way has been made so that we can approach God in all his undiluted holy otherness. Listen to what Colossians 1, 21 to 22 says. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. For all who trust Christ, the promise of which was Moses' hope, for all who trust Christ, what was once a don't come near, what was once Only the dread of falling into the holy hands of the living God instead becomes a welcome. Because Christ, who died to remove our unholiness, presents us to God as holy instead. And in this, is not God revealed to us in his redeeming? Now, while Moses is afraid to look at God, Yahweh says to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. There's that beautiful possessiveness of the Lord over his covenant people. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. Here's a repeat of 2, 24, and 25. God sees, God hears, God knows. But you might be wondering, if this is a repeat, where's his remembrance? Now, if you remember that God remembering his covenant means God applying or God acting to fulfill his promises, it's there in verses 8 and 9 as we continue. Moses is too afraid to look at God. God has seen the affliction of his people. And then he says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, flowing with milk and honey to the place of these nations. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. God reveals himself to us in his redeeming, first as holy, second as deliverer. God is deliverer. And I want you to see with me two sides of the same coin as we consider this aspect of what God is like. First, God is a deliverer who redeems us from. Notice carefully the language. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. 
to bring them up out of that land. That's one side. God is a deliverer who redeems us from. God comes down to bring us up, which is a common description of the redeeming the Israelites experienced through the Exodus. And notice that many words have been used to this point in Exodus to describe the plight of the Israelites and what they need to be redeemed from. It's affliction, it's heavy burdens, it's oppression, it's ruthless, it's slavery, it's bitter, there's groaning, there's sufferings, and all of these at the hands of the Egyptians. And they've been here for centuries, and they can't get out. And from this... The Israelites needed delivering from, which is surely a type, a picture of the greater burden of the pang of sin and the taskmaster of Satan and the groan of death that we all languish under. Thanks be to God that in Christ he came down to break the power of sin and destroy the works of the devil and deliver us from the bondage of the fear of death and even death itself in his resurrection. But that's only half the picture. God isn't merely a deliverer who redeems from. God is a deliverer who redeems for or to. There's another side to consider in the richness of this coin. Again, if you look carefully at the language of verse 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God is going to deliver from the evils of the land of Egypt to a good land. He's going to deliver them from the crush of oppression to a broad land, a spacious place. God is going to deliver from the years of being robbed as slaves to a land that is rich. It's able to accommodate large flocks which produce plenty of goat's milk. It's a land that has ability for much crops. It can produce much honey or maybe saps or juices from the fruit trees and from the vineyards and from the the figs and all of these types of things. The God who gave Adam and Eve every fruit-bearing tree as food to eat in the garden is not a miser. He is abundant. He's generous. He's kind. He's going to give the promise of land to the Israelites as he swore to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, yet even as abundant as this was. It is but a taste of what is to come in light of the sights and sounds and tastes of the new creation, of the inheritance of the whole earth that all who trust in Christ will receive. And so when you think as God, as deliverer, if you want to know what he's really like, don't merely consider what he delivers from, Consider what God has delivered us to. He's delivered us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He's delivered us from slavery to sin to slavery to righteousness. From what our sins deserve to the incredible riches of his kindness that he will show to us in the coming ages. From serving idols to serving the living and the true and living God. Now in my experience as a pastor so far, I've noticed that many people often only consider the first part. I've heard many testimonies of people coming to realize that salvation was more than a mere get-out-of-jail-free card. As an insurance against hellfire, only then to live in this unhealthy fear of God who just begrudgingly bestows salvation upon you. But that can be further from the truth. God delivers from, he delivers to, and he delights to. And I imagine that this is sounding pretty spectacular to Moses until he receives the unexpected shock in verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Sorry, what? Come again now? Sorry, what did you say? You're sending who? Me? No? I don't think he was expecting things to take that turn. And what this indicates is there's some areas of submission required in this call of Moses, and God's calling any of us to do anything for him. First, please recognize and submit to God's doing this in his own timing. Any point in the previous centuries would have been good 
for any of the Israelites who were alive at the time to be brought up out of Egypt. But it wasn't until 400 years had passed that God remembered that God acted. Victor Hamilton writes, like many of God's people, incarcerated Israel will have to learn, maybe with some bewilderment and anger, that God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. As the song goes, in his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Second, please also submit to God doing this in his own way. By all means, God could do this himself. He doesn't need Moses. He's burning in the bush and it's not consumed. He doesn't need anyone. But in his divine prerogative, Yahweh has chosen Moses and calls Moses into his service as an instrument to bring about the redemption of his people from Egypt. And truly, there's no greater honor than to be a vessel fit for use in the hands of the Lord to bring about his purposes. Not only does the Lord condescend in using his creatures, allowing us to, uh, to, to partner with him, he blesses us by bestowing such an undeserved honor of being used by this holy deliverer. But like Moses, we're not always open to being used in the way that God designs. This divine voluntelling doesn't exactly sit very well with Moses. In the exchange that follows, however, more is wondrously revealed about this God who redeems and who reveals himself to us in his redeeming. We've seen that he's holy. We've seen that he is deliverer. And third, we see that God is covenant keeper. In his redeeming, God shows us that all the promises he makes, he follows through on. He is covenant keeper. Moses is barefoot. His face is hidden from God. And Moses says to God in verse 11, Who am I? Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, some people see in this question a sense of humility in Moses, and it could be. Moses knows he's inadequate to stand before the king of Egypt. This is the most powerful person on the planet, and bring people out of slavery who have been there for a very long time. But as the conversation continues in chapter 3 and then into chapter 4, Moses' questions seem more like resistance than humility. As someone has put it, God says, go four times, and Moses keeps trying to find ways to say, no, thank you very much. Now, in response to the first question, God says, but I will be with you. Moses was asking, who am I? When, as Victor Hamilton again puts it, he should have been focused on whose am I? God wasn't saying to Moses that he would be called and sent off all on his own sin. God's under no illusions that this is beyond Moses, that's why he says to him, but I will be with you. In other words, Moses is God's. Moses is one of God's covenant people. The promise made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, it's for Moses, it's for Israel, it's for all who trust in Jesus, the offspring of Abraham. God said to Abraham in Genesis 17, 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. That's the promise. God said to Isaac in Genesis 26, 3, sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. God said to Jacob in Genesis 28, 14, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And so this is what Graham Goldsworthy calls the premier promise of Scripture. God will be our God, and we will be his people. So in response to Moses' question, God says, but I will be with you. In faithfulness to this promise, in his redeeming of us, God reveals himself to us as covenant keeper. And he has not reneged on this covenant promise yet. You can search for yourself the many places in the Old Testament to hear that God says that he is with his people. And nothing changes across that divide from Malachi to Matthew. For we have Jesus' words at the end of Matthew, and surely I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. In Hebrews 13, it's the basis for the exhortation to keep our lives free from the love of money. 
for contentment, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can say confidently, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can Pharaoh do to me? God revealing his covenant faithfulness and promising to be with us, it has unending implications. Most notably, our overarching hope for the world that is to come. God with Adam and Eve and Eden. God with the patriarchs. God with Moses, the human instrument of his redemption. God with the nation of Israel. God with the church, culminating in Revelation 21.3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Both now and forever, revealed in his redeeming of us, God says, I'm a covenant keeper. So wherever we go, wherever God sends us, whatever task God assigns to us, he promises to be with us. To any response of I can't or who am I, God's word reminds us, whose are you? He knows we can't. But he says, I will be with you. So whatever God may be calling you to, fill in your blank. Who am I that blank? God says, but I will be with you. Moreover, God would prove this to Moses via the following sign in 3.12. But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. The next time Moses is there at the mountain of God, Israel will be with them. That will be the proof, the evidence that God was with them, which we can look back on and see as, uh, as clearly that God actually follows through on what he says he will. But the sign that Moses will receive requires faith. He has to step out, to go, to obey to walk by faith and not by sight. To embrace the fact that by himself this is impos- impossible, but with God this is most certainly not. Now back there and then, apparently this is not enough for Moses, so he raises another question. His first concern is with himself. Who am I? His second concern is with the people of Israel. Look at verse 13. Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, What shall I say to them? Now, before we get to God's response, we do well to understand Moses' question. He's asking a hypothetical, which is kind of hilarious. Suppose I go, God, I'm not saying I'm going, but for argument's sake, just for a second. Let's say that I go. I wonder if you've ever spoken to the Lord that way when his word is clearly calling us to walk before him in obedience. We try to find all sorts of excuses to wriggle our way out of following through, and oh, it's cringeworthy, isn't it? We know, like Moses, that God is holy. We know, as Moses will soon, that he is deliverer, and we know that in a far greater way than Moses does. We know, like Moses, that God promises to never leave us nor forsake us, and then when God calls us, we play the what if game. We invent these hypotheticals which in Moses' case, and often our own, actually don't materialize. The Israelites never ask him this question. Nevertheless, in God's grace and kindness, he reveals himself to us in his redeeming. He's holy, he's deliverer, he's covenant keeper, he is sovereign Lord. He is sovereign Lord. In answer to Moses' question, which isn't who are you, but more what are you like, Hear God's response in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now as we stand on this holy ground with Moses, I want just to read the following words to you, continuing, I guess, with the ocean illustration theme. I found these words very helpful. There is much meaning in God's name, but there is also mystery. The sentences 
I am that I am and I am has sent me are intentionally strange to our ears. They imply that there is much about this God who simply is that we cannot understand. However, God has not revealed his name for our speculation, but for our faith, encouragement, comfort, and hope. Our knowledge of God is like a young child's knowledge of the ocean when she wades into it. However, as John Preston reminds us, it is one thing to stand on the shore to look out into the vastness of the ocean and admire it, but another thing to go in too deep, for then we will drown. The depths of I am are beyond us, and we must contentedly stay within the boundaries of what he has revealed concerning himself. Now, just to let you in on a little bit of sort of the pain of the preacher from week to week, one of the challenges of understanding the meaning of this phrase is the number of different ways we could translate I am who I am. I'm going to dig in with me for a little bit, for a few minutes here. There are three words in Hebrew. The middle could be translated as who or which or that. On either side, you have these identical words from the Hebrew verb to be, and it could be translated in all sorts of different ways. He is I am that I am. He is, I will be who I am. He is, I am who I will be. He is, I am he who causes to be. And we could go on. The name Yahweh is based upon this and appears some five, 6,000 times in Scripture. In Hebrew, it's four consonants. You might have heard the tetragrammaton. And since ancient Jews, out of reverence, would not pronounce the name because they didn't want to mispronounce it, we actually don't know the exact pronunciation to this day. A Jewish reader of the Old Testament would see Yahweh, and they would say Adonai, which means Lord. Older readers of the Bible would take the vowels from Adonai and add them to the consonants from Yahweh, which gives us Jehovah, a pronunciation some of you would still use today. In our English translations of the Old Testament, Yahweh appears as Lord in capitals. The reason I say Yahweh when I read the Scripture instead of Lord is so that we understand this is God's name. It's not a title. Lord in lowercase is a, t- is a title. Lord in uppercase is God's name, which we derive from God's answer to Moses in Exodus 3.14. In the New Testament, the Greek word Lord is the equivalent of this, and it's applied to Jesus. And we'll come back to John 8.58 in a few moments. Many other passages attribute um, this to uh, Jesus in his deity. He is the one who was and is and is to come. Now, as theologians identify, and I quote the expression, I am, it is a startlingly unqualified declaration of personal being. God is revealing his personal name. And in our hearing of his name, we ought to understand that, I quote again, essence belongs to God in a unique and absolute manner. He exists in and of himself. He is personal, he is relational, but he depends on no one outside of himself to be. He is, he always has been, he always will be, he has life in and of himself. In all of this, we hear that he is eternal, that he is unique, that he is independent, that he is absolutely and ultimately sovereign. Someone writes, it may be that in the burning bush, God provided a visual representation of the divine name. Here is a fire that never uses up its fuel. A fire that is independent of outside sources and burns of its own inexhaustible energy. Thus God declared, I am that I am. The same fire, however, did not appear in the distant heavens, but in an ordinary bush near where sheep graze. At the burning bush, God met with a man and spoke to him. The devouring fire became the holy companion of his people dwelling in their midst. Thus, God declared, I am with you. And if you find that incredible, and I trust you do, how much more so the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who again, in no uncertain terms, equated himself to this great I am in John 8, 58. When he says, before Abraham was, I am, and they pick up stones to throw at him, they know exactly what he's meaning. That's why they wanted to stone him. The I am, Yahweh, appearing to Moses in the bush is certainly incredible, yet it pales in comparison to the great I am taking on human flesh, 
walking among us, dying to save us, rising to justify us, ascending to intercede for us, dwelling in us, and promising to return for us so that we may always be with the I Am Himself. In all of this, we see that Yahweh, He is this covenant keeper. He is this sovereign Lord. And as sovereign Lord, he is thus able to exercise all power and authority to keep covenant to be faithful. His revealing himself as sovereign Lord in his redeeming is also to reveal himself as covenant keeper in his redeeming. The two are related. It's difficult to take them apart. So when you hear the name Yahweh, when you read capital letters Lord in your Bible, think covenant keeping sovereign Lord. That's what he's like. And that is how he's to be known among his people as he instructs Moses to relay to the elders and the people of Israel in verses 15 through 17, which I won't read again. And I would argue, anticipating fully Moses' next objection, God continues to speak to Moses to express the ways he will reveal his absolute power as sovereign Lord. God reveals himself to us and is redeeming. He shows us he is holy He is deliverer, he is covenant keeper, he is sovereign Lord, and finally, that he is unstoppable. He is omnipotent, Caleb prayed, all-powerful. He is unstoppable. Notice that Moses has a question about himself. Who am I? Then he has a question about the people of Israel. What about the people, and what if they say this to me? And then it seems before he could even get a question out of his mouth about Pharaoh and the Egyptians, God Hear what God says as proof of his being unstoppable. First, in verse 18, he says, And they will listen to your voice. That is the people of Israel. They will listen to you, Moses. Don't you worry about that. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. Now I'm sure you can imagine Moses' hesitation, humanly speaking. The last time he tried to intervene, well, he ended up killing a guy. That didn't go well. And when he tried to stop two people from fighting, two Hebrews from fighting, he was scolded by one of them. And if that was just regular Joe Jew on the job, how is he going to be received by the elders of Israel, especially after he's been in hiding for 40 years while the Israelites have been suffering in Egypt? But God says, they'll listen. The people of Israel will not get in my way of revealing myself in my redeeming. Second, in verses 19 and 20, God says, But I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. God knows Pharaoh thinks he's a big man. He knows Pharaoh thinks himself as a son of a God, as divine. God knows Pharaoh thinks the gods of Egypt are in charge around here. And God knows that Pharaoh will not back down except at a show of might. But when Yahweh flexes his muscles and causes a commotion in Egypt and not in Goshen, that's a different story. Psalm 78 summarizes the marvels everyone is about to encounter. He redeemed them from the foe when he performed signs in Egypt and his marvels in the fields of Zoar. He turned their rivers to blood so that they could not drink of their streams. He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave their crops to the destroying locust and the fruit of their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamores with frost. He gave over their cattle to the hail and their flocks to thunderbolts. He let loose on them his burning anger, his wrath, his indignation and distress, a company of destroying angels. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave their lives over to the plague. He struck down every firstborn in Egypt, the firstfruits of their strength in the tents of Ham. Then he led out his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them in safety so that they were not afraid, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to his holy land, to the mountain which his right hand had won. There is nothing stopping that. The people of Israel aren't going to get in the way. Pharaoh isn't going to get in the way of God redeeming and revealing himself in his redeeming, as we will see as we continue in Exodus. And third, in verses 21 and 22, look at what this says. I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go... You shall not go empty. 
But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and daughters. The heart of God is incredible. It's about the little kids. So shall you plunder the Egyptians. One of our life groups asked this week, why were they instructed to do this? That's a little weird. Well, God gives them favor first. Then they were invited to plunder, which is a matter of compensation. For centuries, the Egyptians have been robbing the Israelites by enslaving them, and it's still going on to the present generation, and now it's time for the Hebrews to get paid. And what will happen with these resources? Yes, there is that sad account of some of it being thrown into the fire and a golden calf being fashioned as idol worship when Moses is up on the mountain. But in Exodus 25 to 40, when they're building the tabernacle and the people are bringing so much, they have to be told to stop. What do you think they were bringing? They were bringing all the things they took up with them out of Egypt so that they could build the tabernacle where God's presence would dwell in their midst and they would worship. Nothing, not the Israelites, not Pharaoh, not the consequences of 400 years of slavery are going to get in the way of God revealing himself in his redeeming. And so here, predominantly, we are to see God granting favor to have all that they would need to worship God in the way he would instruct and command at Sinai. To modify a familiar phrase, God's work that God commands to be done in God's way never lacks God's supply of grace or of grace gifts. When God wants to reveal himself and his redeeming, None of his people will get in the way. None of his enemies will get in the way. No lack will get in the way. For he is the Holy One. He is the Deliverer. He is the Covenant Keeper. He is the Sovereign Lord. He is unstoppable. And so Paul asks, as he takes in all of this exodus, as he takes in the greater exodus of Christ from sin and slavery and Satan, he says, if God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave us up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Any doubt over who he is demands another look at who he reveals himself to be in his redeeming. All that we need to know about God in order to trust him is unveiled there. And trust is certainly the appropriate response that honors God here. Knowing that this is who he is, my simple question and conclusion is, in what ways will you trust him and therefore honor him in this week to come? Let's sing before we dismiss.